they know where you live. They feed on your flaws. They drain your time. And they never leave you alone. Hey, I need to run a few errands. Can you watch my dog? Again? We're going to get into the Word this morning, part three of this series, Relational Vampires. And I don't know how you feel about this series, but I feel like I was duped a little bit. Like we got these cute little invitations with the fangs on them and this funny bumper that before the message. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a fun series. And then Pastor Jason was swinging a big hammer the last two weeks, and I said way more ouches then I said amens because it was hitting me uh, in, in places I wasn't expecting to be hit. And I was, I was uncomfortable and I was convicted and I was challenged. And, and so I hope that you too are receiving from the word as we're diving into this very practical, applicable series, Relational Vampires. And, and really what it's about, it's about how to deal with and also how to love difficult people in our lives and it's such a, a good time for this kind of series as we're getting ready to go into the holidays and some of you are thinking about family that's coming out to visit that you get to see once or twice a year and you're really excited and there's some other family members there's an uncle or an aunt that's crazy and you're like okay they're coming too and so we've got to make like a spare bedroom for them and put up with them for a couple of days and five minutes into the visit they've told the same story three times and you're ready for them to go home and so we have these people in our lives as well so we're figuring out how to to handle how to love appropriately and how we can best influence those people in our lives and we're also kind of shining a light inside right we're, we're seeing some ways that we've been controlling that we've been critical and and even today we're gonna be talking about that relational vampire that sucks the life out of you the the needy vampire and so we're, we know some needy people we also can have some needy tendencies in our lives and so this series we're starting with this main thought every week it's not in your notes but this is the thought for the series, and that's all relationships come from what we actively create and what we passively allow. This is kind of the theme and the thought with each message is that every relationship we have, it comes from something that we are actively creating in our lives, a scenario, a situation, or something because of our, our lack of, 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 of strategy or because we're just... Uh, apathetic in that situation or we don't want to have an argument or don't want to have something uncomfortable happen we passively allow these things in our lives and so we're gonna be looking today at this idea of of needy vampires and and we're not here to to villainize anyone that maybe is needing our lives but we're here to expose some things and find out how we can properly love those people and this is our theme verse Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 Paul says this do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul here is giving us this scripture, this verse, this idea of, of we can't do anything from a place of selfishness. We can't do anything uh, that is just about us, but we also must be helping others as well. If we, we can reread that scripture and say that we, we look, each of you, not only to his own needs, but also to the needs of others. It would be the same thing there. And so when we're talking about relational vampires that might be needy, then, then, then what does it mean if we have needs in our lives? Because I, I just say, like, as we're talking about needy people, all of us have needs. All of us are going to have seasons of needs. We're all going to have situations. You might be right now in a season of dire need. You might be waiting for a miracle in your life right now, physically, emotionally, financially. You might need a healing. You might need God to rescue you. And, and I don't want you to think that, that we're preaching at you this morning, but rather we're looking at the Word. And I want you to understand this truth that having needs and being needy are not the same. Having needs and being needy are not the same thing. And I want to expose some things this morning and, and maybe look at some, some evidences of what it really means to be needy. And we're going to go to Luke chapter 15 this morning. And this chapter has my favorite story in the entire Bible, this story of the prodigal son. And if you've been in church very long at all, 
you're probably familiar with this story, but this, this son, this young man, he told his father, basically, I'll sum up to you, he said, basically, Dad, I, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait for you to pass away. I don't want to live under your rule. I don't want to live under your house. I want to do my own thing. And so the father gave him his inheritance, and the prodigal son went to a foreign land, and he indulged in every vice available to man. He was sleeping around, he was, he was partying, he had lots of good time friends around him, and he spent every single dime that was given to him. And he found himself in dire need and dire want, and he decides that he's going to go home to his father to be a servant. The father sees him a long way off, runs to him, rescues him, and restores him as a son. And I love that story. It is the heart of God for each and every one of us. But there's another part to the story that oftentimes we don't talk about. And I want us to look at it this morning in Luke chapter 15. The Bible says that there was a man who had how many? Two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. The prodigal's decision to get his inheritance early impacted and affected the older son. Now, just for you to understand, when there's an inheritance and a, a division of the estate, the older son gets two-thirds of the estate, and the younger son gets one-third of the estate. The younger son who got the one-third left and went partying, and the older son stayed and worked in his father's house. And when we read this story and we, we read about the older son, you think, oh, this guy was faithful, he stayed in the house, he was a hard worker, he loved his dad. But as you really begin to dissect this story, we find that maybe, just maybe, the older son was a vampire. There might be some things about his life that we see that make us understand that he was extremely needy. And we're going to unpack that a little bit today. So I want three things to show you that might expose some neediness in our life. And the first one is, and, and you can write this down, is we have no sense of identity. Needy relational vampires have no sense of their true identity. They will always assume the identity and the role of someone they're around. We see people that don't have identity lose themselves in the identity of their spouses. They can never be apart. They tell their, their spouse, hey, I'm going to run to the store. And they say, okay, text me every five minutes so I know that you're okay. You know, some of you got that stalker app on your iPhone where you know where they're at at all times. You watch, they're driving around the corner right now. You know who you are. That's creepy, okay? I'm just going to tell you right now. Let me tell you something. When I was a kid, you had about three hours to reach people in the day. From four to seven in the afternoon is when you could reach somebody before cell phones and you couldn't call during supper or dinner because then your parents would answer and say, he can't talk right now, the family's having dinner. And they would have to call back at 8 o'clock when you were done having dinner. And then you're only allowed 30 minutes because you had to finish your homework and then go to bed. And then we had this miraculous thing called cell phones where we now carry a computer in our pocket. And I want to tell you something. It was better before. It's better before. But they're a blessing. Text me every five minutes this Lose your identity. You don't have a self-purpose or identity, but you're lost in, in, a, in an obsessive relationship or a dysfunctional marriage. Other people, they, they can assume identity of their career and their job. They're nothing without their title. They're nothing without their salary. They're, they're nothing without their check. And, and, and they become workaholics because they don't really know who they are in Christ. And, and they're working 24-7. And we, we justify it. And we say we're getting our hustle on. And we're securing the bag. And whatever else you want to call it. I just call it payday. But whatever you want to call it, you can call it. And we justify it. But the reality is we're losing ourselves because we have no sense of who we really are. We lose our identity to peer pressure. What's... What's hip? What's fashionable right now? Are skinny jeans still in or is it flares? I, I don't know. I saw someone tight rolling their jeans the other day. And I thought, huh, I did that when I was in seventh grade. I, they're bringing it back. And, I, and then when, you know, when you're in seventh grade, we didn't wear socks and, and you, you tight rolled your jeans. And every sweaty teenage boy's feet reeked every day. And so they're bringing the tight rolled jeans back, but I see them wearing socks. I'm like, well done. You've learned something. Good job. 
But we do. We lose, we lose ourselves in peer pressure and fashion and fad, and we have to be the latest thing or do the latest thing. Or, or you know somebody that every time you get a haircut, they show up the next week with the same haircut? Or they ask you, oh, where'd you get those shoes? And you tell them, and they show up the next day with the exact same shoes. We're twinning. And you're like, oh, that's great. How fun. Let's go to Disneyland together. Needy, relational vampires that assume our identities. So we go back to Luke chapter 15, and this prodigal son, he's returned home. The father has restored him. They're having this celebration, and the older son, who's the faithful worker that we think is the good person in this story, he comes from working at the field all day, and they're having a party. And he throws a fit and will not go in and celebrate his brother's return. And so the father goes out, and he talks to him. And look what the son says to the father. He answered his father and he said, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. This accusation and never disobeyed your order. Here's this, this son and he calls himself a slave in his father's house. He has no sense of who he really is. There's no true identity that he is actually a son to his father. But rather, he's been lost in serving. He's been lost in working. He's been lost in this idea that if I do enough, then I'll be important. And the problem is we can never earn the grace that Christ extends to us to give us our identity. And so he's lost in this moment, and he calls himself a slave he's in his father's house within proximity of his father and he refers to himself and his identity as a slave and not a son and I wonder for us how many times we attend church on a regular basis but we don't really identify ourselves as Christians or part of the community or sons and daughters of the king and we come and we, we call ourselves Christians and we're in proximity of having an encounter with Christ, but we never really surrender to that and so we're unsure of our identity. We can even serve as a replacement for our position as a son or a daughter. And this is nothing new. This isn't something that we've built as a society. Even at the beginning of the New Testament church, Paul writes to the church in Colossians, and they're dealing with the same thing. They're a young, new church. And every time something new and approved comes along, they adapt it. Oh, we're going to do that. Oh, this is a new move. Oh, this is a new word. Oh, this is a new fashion. This is a new style. And they adapt, they adapt, they adapt until they completely lose their identity. But Paul says this to them. He says, in Christ, you have been brought to fullness or been made complete, if you do a word study on that. He is the head over every power and authority. See, every time something new would come along, they would institute that into their belief system, into their church, and it began to nullify and muddy up the waters and begin to dilute their identity as Christians. And Paul said, Christ is head over everything else, and in him we are made complete. Our identity is in him, and we are secure in him. But when we're relational vampires, when we're needy, when we don't have a sense of identity, ultimately it leads to the second problem. Relational vampires that are needy make it about themselves. We make everything about us. Relational vampires that are needy will manipulate every situation, every scenario. They are prone to the drama in life. They are prone to throw fits and throw hands and turn tables and get upset about every single thing, and they will assume the starring role in every story. They make it about themselves. Let me ask you this. Have you ever told a story in a more favorable way than it really happened about yourself? Do you live off the likes and the hearts that you get on social media? Do you obsess when people leave you on read when you've sent them a text? Do you assume people don't like you because they didn't shake your hand or say hello to you or walked right by on a Sunday morning? If you deal with any of these issues, you might 
be a needy relational vampire. And if you are, there's hope. <laughs> and if you know someone that is like that in your life, there's hope. Needy people will assume the starring role and they love to play the victim. So the father goes out to the older son who's sitting outside pouting. In Luke chapter 15, verses 29 through 30. And this is what the son says. You never gave me even a young goat. See, when the father restored the prodigal son, the son said, I'm not worthy to be your son, I'll be your servant. And he said, put a robe around his shoulders, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, kill the fatted calf, because my son who was dead is now alive. He celebrated and restored him. They're killing the fatted calf, the one that they were preparing for that big celebration. And the older son says, you never gave me even a young goat. Two-thirds is what he got. Two-thirds of the estate. So I could celebrate with my friends. But look, they'll, not only will, will a needy relational vampire, will they make themselves the, the, assume the starring role, and they'll make themselves the victim, but then they'll villainize other people. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. It's this, it's this idea that, that we are entitled to something greater than we actually deserve and that somehow we earn it, but when we make everything about ourselves and we become so needy that we suck the life out of every situation, here they're having a celebration and a party, but the older sons, nope, I'm going to make a scene. I'm going to throw a fit. I want this story to be about me. We're not going to celebrate anybody else, but we're going to make it about my issues and my problems. And his idea is so skewed that he's accusing the father who gave him the greater portion of the inheritance. You never even gave me a young goat. So here's the thing, though. When we come to Christ, it's not about us. So no longer can we make it about ourselves. Paul talks about this in Galatians 2.20. He says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. It's not about me, is what he's saying. But Christ lives in me. And he said, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When we're relational vampires, it's all about us. But Paul says when we become new creatures in Christ Jesus, that we no longer live, but now we live in Christ. It becomes a life of faith. And this is, this is the rub when we're needy, when we, when we don't have a good sense of who we really are, and we don't know our identity, and when we make everything about ourselves, then it leads to this third problem, which is we have the wrong priorities. Relational vampires have the wrong priorities. Remember, Paul said in Philippians 2 at the beginning, he said, don't do anything from selfish ambition, right? But when we're relational vampires and we're sucking the life out of people, we do everything from a place of selfishness. Everything is about us. Everything needs to be about our situation, our problems, our struggles, and we don't have Christ first. We're not looking after anyone else's interests or needs, but we're consumed with what's going on in our lives. So the father speaks to the son there in Luke 15, and he pleads with him, trying to help him understand. He said, my, my son, you are always with me. And he tries to bring some light here. Everything I have belongs to you. Everything I have is yours. You have access to everything. When you come to Christ, when you become a son or daughter of the king of kings, then you have access to the kingdom of God. That means you have access to healing. That means you have access to peace. That means you have access to joy. These things are readily available for children of, of God. And so when we come to Christ and we're new creatures in Christ Jesus, everything in the kingdom belongs to us. And the Father tries to show him the priorities. He said, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, he was lost and he is found. Remember, everything I have is yours. My son, he called himself a slave. He said, you never gave me anything. And the father, with his love and his patience, calls him a son and tries to restore him and get him to understand priorities. 
So here's the needy test priority. Can you celebrate others when they celebrate? Do you struggle with jealousy? Is everything in life a competition? Let me put it this way. Do you race the soccer mom to the next red light on White Lane? <laughs> Do you measure your success by someone else's failure? Because if you do, you might be a needy relational vampire. Ouch. Jesus talked about this. Because we have needs. It's okay to have needs. You might be thinking, I can't have needs. I can't have issues in my life. It makes me needy. No, there's a difference between having needs and being needy. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew 6 and Luke chapter 12. He's talking about all the things in life that consume us all of the needs of this life and he gives this principle so that we have the, the right priorities in Luke chapter 12 verse 31 he says seek his kingdom Matthew 6 33 says seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be given to you as well talking about the needs of life seeking the kingdom of God and these things will be added to you so if we if we see maybe some needy tendencies in our life or we we know someone that maybe is a relational vampire in our life and if you invited them this morning don't look at them because it's not about them it's not about you this is this a good word for somebody we're not pointing fingers and making villains that's not that's not why we're here this morning because often people that struggle with neediness it started from a place of real need they, they started from a situation where they had a crisis and they were never ever able to escape from that moment the need was never met. There was never community to restore them. They went through a hard time, and they've never received healing. And so through a course of time, they've learned this pattern of being needy. So we're not here to villainize. We're here to help. So how do we help without hurting? How do we do the right things? And I want us to look at a story in Acts chapter 3 with Peter and John. The Bible says that one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And now a man who was lame from birth, he was born this way. He was lame from birth. We, we, we can't call him needy when, when he was lame from birth. This is, this is a need. It's not needy. But watch what happens. He was carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg. He was taken to the, the, the gate called Beautiful, which was the main central gate that gave you direct access into the temple courts. And there were a couple other gates that there was a, a gate for the Gentiles, there was a gate for, uh, for the women in that culture in that time and, and children. But the center gate, the gate called Beautiful, was the main gate that went into the temple courts where everyone had direct access. And so someone had carried this lame man every day to the gate so that he could beg. So here, he's lame from birth, that's a need. What happens here is he becomes needy. And there's a dysfunction here in understanding trying to help instead they're hurting. And so he was put there to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money because that's what he's learned to do. That was the only way that he could take care of himself. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. How do we help people that are in real need without helping people be needy? That's the rub. Because there will always be needs. There will always be good causes. There will always be opportunities. But how do we know which ones are the right ones? And I want you to understand this truth, and I, I, please take this with you. You can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. You cannot say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. And I want to give you three ways to help three ways to help those in need and to help those that might be needy the first way that we can help is we give strategically we give with strategy and can I be honest with you it's easier to give without strategy it's easier in a moment to give a dollar and make someone go away and feel better about yourself than it is to take the time to give strategically it's easier to put a band-aid on a wound than it is to actually heal a wound. 
And it's important that we give strategically in life. Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, they, they come up to the gate called Beautiful. And the Bible says when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him as did John. Hang on just a second. Look straight at him as did John. And this is something that I want to point out to you because oftentimes in our lives, it is so much easier to ignore those people that are in desperate need and pretend that we don't see them. It's uncomfortable when they're standing on the side of the street with their sign as you're stopped at the red light leaving the restaurant. It's uncomfortable as you're coming off of the freeway and someone there is in need or they approach you in a parking lot. And, and let me just say, I don't give money out. I'm not condoning that. I'm not saying you need to give money to everybody. I'll feed somebody. I'm more than happy to do that. But we give strategically. But here in this moment, Peter and John tell the man, they, or they look straight at him. They, they bring value to this man who has no identity other than being a needy beggar. And they look at him, bringing value to his humanity. And that's so important. And then they go on to say, Peter said, look at us. Look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. If you can imagine this lame man sitting on the ground at the gate called Beautiful every day with his hand up or his cup out, asking for money, but looking at the ground. And Peter and John walk up full of Christ, full of the Holy Spirit, and they, they look at him, they give him identity as a human, and they say, raise your eyes of expectation in this moment. Look up from where you're at, because we're going to give you strategically. And that's so, so critical, changing his view and giving strategically. I heard a story just the other day about a, a pastor a couple and they had a, a family in their church that was in need during the Christmas season. The father had been out of work for some time and couldn't get another job in his field and they were struggling and they heard that they were not going to have Christmas. And so out of the abundance of their heart and the, the goodness of their heart, they wanted to bless this family. So him and his wife went, uh, these pastors, and they bought gifts for the entire family, bought gifts for all their kids. They wrapped them up in beautiful paper and bows and they drove to the house. They went to the house, and they came in with all these presents, and the kids were celebrating. The kids were so excited. They had gifts, and they felt so good in this moment. They're completely just trying to be a blessing, not out of selfish ambition or their own interest at all. Their heart really was to be a blessing. This pastor said as he was standing there in the front room watching the kids, he looked over to the side of the room, and sitting in the corner was the father with his head in his hands in shame. And he'd shame this man. And what he said to these kids was, I can do for you what your father cannot. And he could have been more strategic in what he did. He could, have, he could have given the guy a job, some side jobs at his house or at their church. He could have asked him, hey, do you have any money for Christmas? Let me match what you have. He could have even, even said, let me pick you up. We're going to go shopping for your kids and let the father bless him. But, but instead what he did, he, he did not on purpose, but to, to build his own self up. To make himself feel good. And he said these words, and I'll never forget them. He said, what that man needed in that moment was dignity, and what I gave him was toys. We need to give strategically. We need to give strategically. And that leads us to the second thing, and that's we need to serve wisely. We need to serve wisely. When we give strategically, we have to be wise in how we serve. And can I just say this? You cannot give on credit. You cannot give on credit. You can't draw water from a dry well. And I love what Peter says to this man in Acts chapter 3. When the man asks for money, Peter says, The silver and gold I do not have. But look at these words. But what I do have, I will give you. What I do have, I will give you. We must serve with what God has given us to serve with. We cannot give on credit. We can't draw water from a dry well. But we do have something in our hands that we can serve with. We can give relationally. We can give emotionally. We can give spiritually. We can give financially as long as we have it to give. But when we're depleted in those areas, then we cannot give out of our lack we must give from our abundance in those moments and i love that he says i don't have money but what i do have 
I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I love discovery. I love that we ask people to come and serve here on the team. And if you're not part of the dream team, man, we would love for you to be a part of the dream team and serve. We have step three this afternoon. It's going to be amazing. Love for you to come out and be a part of that at 330. But we have this principle here at Discovery Church of worship one, serve one. Serve one, sit one is what we call it. And that means that when you come and serve here, we love that. We want you to be a part of the team, but we also want you to be ministered to. And so if you're serving service after service after service and you're never sitting in a service, you're never hearing the word, you're never lost in worship and you're not replenishing yourself and taking care of yourself, then you're not going to have anything to give. And so we serve wisely. We make sure that we continue to replenish ourselves. Everyone's need cannot be yours to carry. Everyone's bills cannot be yours to pay. Everyone's dysfunction cannot be yours to fix. And if you think God can't help people unless you are completely run ragged and exhausted, then your God is too small. Because he doesn't need us, he chooses to use us. And we need to understand that. So how? How then, if if, if we need to give strategically, if we need to serve wisely, and and there are real needs, and and there's just not enough of you to go around, then then, then how do we serve? How do we help? How do we, how do we come out of our needy dysfunctions? We do this third thing, and that is to trust God completely. We trust God completely. Don't make God so small that he can't meet the need without you, and don't let your faith be so small that you can't believe for the impossible. We trust God completely. I love what Peter goes on to say here to this man who's been lame since birth. He says, I don't have money. But what I do have, I'll give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And then he does this next thing in trusting God completely. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. There was a next step in this faith that Peter had. He said, not only am I going to pray for you, but I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to take you by the hand. I'm going to come alongside you. When we see relational vampires, needy people in our lives starting to take steps out of that, then we need to come alongside them. We need to say, hey, we're here to help you. Hey, I, I'm here to believe with you. I'm going to pray with you. I, I'm going to help you stand up. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what I have to give you, and, and I'm not going to give you any more, and I'm not going to be an enabler, and I'm not going to feed your dysfunction, but I'm going to help you find out who you are in Christ so that you can stand on your own two feet. I'm not going to do a quick fix and just drop a coin in the bucket, but I am going to help you stand on your own. And when we take that position, look what happens He takes him, he stands up, he jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. Man, then he went into the temple courts walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This miracle had taken place. God restored this man in this moment because someone trusted God completely. You know what's going to happen when you stop paying your kids' bills? They're going to be able to stand on their own. You know what's going to happen when you stop answering every text from that needy emotional friend? They're going to find some inner strength. You know what's going to happen when you stop having to text your spouse every five minutes, begin to find your own identity? Your marriage is going to get stronger. God's going to show up if we'll allow him some room to show up. This is the truth I want to leave you with today. We're not called to give handouts. We're called to bring healing. This is how we help relational vampires that are needy. And this is the answer if you found yourself being that person, being that needy person that is sucking the life out of people you're in a relationship with. 
If that's you this morning, I want to encourage you that there's a better way. There's a better life. There's a better situation. God has a purpose, a plan, an identity for you. And if you have some people in your life that you don't know how you can cut them off, you don't know how, but they've been sucking the life out of your finances, out of your emotions, out of your resources, I, I know that God's going to give you strength. God's going to give you wisdom. God's going to give you a strategy so that you can be a help and not a hurt to them. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning for just a moment.